edition of our online series on the agenda. My name is Anastasia Pravidna and I'm a strategy and membership manager at European Liberal Forum, foundation and think tank of ALDE Party. We are a member-based organization and we have 45 members based in Europe and beyond. Today, we are gonna talk about upcoming State of the Union address by the European Commissioner Ursula von der Leyen. Last year, during her speech presenting her presidency program in front of the European Parliament, Mrs. von der Leyen quoted Václav Havel. And, met, and let me remind you her quote. Work for something because it's good, not because it stands a chance to succeed. Um, and her message with this quote, I think, was quite clear. As Barroso and Juncker before were faced with major crisis, Ms. von der Leyen hoped that her commission will be challenged by the ambition and will be guided by the ambition, ambition for Europe. She started quite strongly, as we all know, with the uh, Green Deal announced already by the end of 2019, but 2020 did not go that well. And as Juncker and as Barroso before, and as many, many before, Ms. von der Leyen is faced with major crisis. We will keep on going with unprecedented health crisis combined with major economic crisis. The UK is living. We're still not sure what's happening with the transatlantic relations in the upcoming four years. Well, I mean, even if we look within the EU, we still need to agree on the budget and we face to maintain the struggle for the maintaining rule of law within the European Union and within our borders. I think that for our commissioner, this is a chance in her speech to redefine her strategy maybe a bit and take back the agenda. What is important for us for liberals? What are our expectations? Well, this is the question for three our speakers today. And with this in mind, I would like to give the floor to our moderator. Please, Peter. Thanks, Anastasia, for this um, lovely welcome. My name is Peter Müller. I'm with the Spiegel here in Brussels, an EU correspondent. And I'm happy to do the moderation of this event of the European Liberal Forum. We want to talk for an hour about what to expect, as Anastasia just said, about the um, State of the Union speech of Ursula von der Leyen, what projects she might have in mind and um, for the next half year or the next year in European politics. And maybe in this time of crisis also, um, what kind of tone she is able to strike to um, remind Europeans how they might be able and how this continent, how this project might be able to go through the Corona crisis and all the other problems the EU is facing. I'm extremely glad that I have three panelists who will help me digging into these questions. But before I introduce the first one, I wanted to remind all the participants, which I of course warmly welcome as well, that this event is live streamed on the Facebook page of the European Liberal Forum. It is posted in social media. And um, you, the participants, have the opportunity, and I would really encourage you to do so, to send in questions. By now, we all know roughly how the Zoom thing works, so you know that there's a little button on the right-hand bottom corner of your page where you have a Q&A um, section. There you can put in your questions, and they will be sent directly to me, and I will then forward them to our panelists. An alternative is to send in the question via the Facebook page um, of the European Liberal Forum. So feel free to use any way you like to um, jump into this discussion we are about to have now. And now without any further ado, let me give the floor to our first panelist. And of course, we are extremely happy and proud to have with us Hans van Baalen. He's um, it's no introduction in these circles here. He is the head of the ALDE party, has also been the longtime boss of the Liberal Party in the Netherlands, has been an MEP, member of the European Parliament for um, 10 years. So um, he has witnessed quite some State of the Union um, addresses and um, I'm happy Mr. Van Baalen, to ask you now um, and give you the floor about what you are expecting um, from Ursula von der Leyen and her speech in these challenging times for Europe. So, Mr. Van Baalen, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure and honor for me to be in this uh, environment in this panel. First of all, um, I hope that Mrs. van der Leyen is bold, direct, and that she doesn't come with 20 or 30 priorities because then there are no priorities. Uh, and this should not be a bubble event. That means an event which is important for the European Parliament and for the Commission, but it should be an event which is important for the citizens in the member states. And that means that the first thing to address is, of course, COVID, the corona crisis, because that touches everybody, every citizen uh, in every member state. And what we see is that uh, there is almost no real coordination in Europe concerning uh, the management of borders, closing of borders or not. Um, it is uh, for the Dutch, uh, they went to uh, Croatia and had to return. The Germans could stay, uh, those kinds of things. There, the European Union can make a difference. So I hope that she comes with concrete proposals on Corona, also the vaccine, etc., because that will touch every citizen. Uh, the second thing is that I hope that she will not be too bureaucratic uh, and too, uh, let me say, over self-confident. Because a lot of things can be said, Juncker said a lot of things, but it's about implementation. Uh, what We have a Green Deal. Fine. I support the Green Deal. But it should now be implemented. And what are the plans for implementation? Uh, I've seen that Mrs. van der Leyen and the Commission will say, let's speed it up. Uh, let's have a, a more CO2 reduction in 2030. Fine for that, but can we manage it? So she has to be a realist. Um, if you talk about uh, the refugee crisis uh, on Lesbos and other parts of Greece and, and, and in the southern part of Europe, she has to come up with proposals, not just statements. Um, if I look at, uh, let me say, uh, the next generation Europe, let me say the uh, recovery program, uh, very important here is that it is about strengthening the economy. It's not just about spending money, but improving the economy to make it more robust in all the member states. And that means that we have to be tough on member states with their plans. Uh, so the Commission has to be transparent and tough on this. Then this Commission has said we are a geopolitical commission. And maybe let us focus on that. Uh, we have the problem with Belarus, or better said with Putin. To have sanctions on Lukashenko, the so-called president of uh, Belarus, is not enough. It's about sanctions against Putin. It's about Nord Stream, the pipeline number two. It's about uh, access to the international financial markets for Russia. If we want to do something, it should hurt Putin. The same is with Xi Jinping, that's China, about Taiwan, about Hong Kong, about the South China Sea, about the Belt and Road Initiative. China, well, a lot of people call it a partner, but it's highly a rival. So I want to hear something about the international position of the European Union, because every citizen knows that we can't do it on a member state level. And as a liberal, what I hope, it's that it's not too state oriented, whether you talk about national member states or the European Commission. Uh, I'm for free enterprise, for a free market, uh, and uh, for free trade. And of course, that should be managed. But in the end, I don't want to end up in a kind of socialist welfare state. And I hope that uh, that is not the message of van der Leyen. And I hope that Dacian Cholos, the uh, president of the Renew Group, in his rebuttal, in his reaction, will also state that we should be a free market economy and a free society. But Europe has a role to play if it's focused. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Mr. Van Balen. I think this sets the stage, if I might say so, quite well for what's at stake, for what also we, is to be expected or should be expected by the speech of Ms. von der Leyen. And, um, with this question of expectations, I would turn to our second um, panelist, Mr. Petros Fasolas, who is the Secretary General of the European Movement International. 
This is um, the largest European network of pro-European organization bringing together parties, NGOs, people from the academia, from um, 34 different countries. And um, of course, uh, Petros, I would be very interested after Mr. Van Balen said the, the political, the geopolitical stage for the speech, um, what can Ms. von der Leyen do to connect with civil society, um, to connect Europe, this Brussels bubble sphere, with um, European citizens? What's your take on that? The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Peter, and many thanks to the European Liberal Forum for organizing this very timely discussion and inviting some really interesting speakers. I'm, I'm honored to be in a great company and I hope to make a small contribution from our side. Uh, I couldn't imagine a more challenging context for the President of the European Commission to give her first State of the European Union speech. Uh, I think when she was taking over last year and she was starting to think about what the world will be like 12 months later, uh, she wouldn't have predicted what has taken place over the course of 2020. So the conditions for her and for Europe as a whole are remarkably challenging. Uh, and that applies, like Hans said, to every single citizen in Europe. The, the crisis we are in is not one that affects banks or states or anybody else. It affects every single one of us in a very personal and intimate way. So the, uh, I would like to echo what was said already. That should be at the core of the message the European Commission President communicates. We are all in this together. We stand together because that's the only way for society across the continent to pull through and get over the crisis we are facing at the moment. And, and, and again, I, I like to say that what has happened over the last few months, months has changed pretty much everything we have been doing. You know, the, the Green Deal and our approach to climate and the environment, uh, society and the economy, our relationships with each other, but also with the wider world, I really have been considerably affected by this current crisis. So even though we cannot change the course we have set for ourselves radically, we need to consider the new conditions we are in. And that applies certainly on, on the economy. I think that should be one of the key messages that uh, the president should focus on. Uh, earlier in the year, after the, the pandemic uh, took hold, we consulted our member organizations. Like you said, we have a very diverse membership from across society and the political spectrum. So we wanted to see what was their vision for the response the European Union should put in place. And that, of course, applies to the State of the Union speech too. And all of them uh, focused on the following. First of all, the EU needs to come in and help people come through the economic hardship they're facing. Uh, there is real pain taking hold of across Europe in communities in the north, the south, west and east, in rich countries and not so rich countries. And it's imperative that the European Union and its member states put forward the necessary resources to support people. The recovery plan that has been agreed is a very ambitious uh, and significant step in that direction. And now the important thing is to start implementing it quickly and putting it in use. Because after the summer we had, uh, and if there is a second wave, uh, as it is looking that it will be, uh, people's economic conditions will worsen even more. And the European Union needs to be there to support citizens. That's what they're, they're looking for, support in these very difficult times. That, of course, is in the context of the, of the EU budget too. Uh, we had some really difficult discussions around what the spending should be in the next seven years. And, uh, and of course, we went as far as we could, but I think again, it's important to focus our spending, the limiting spending power that the European Union has on areas where it can really make a difference. Uh, the environment, the, tra the transition in the new digital realm that we are experiencing more and more, including in events like this, protecting our environment, providing an economy that works for everyone. So the economy, the EU budget, are really much at the core of what a lot of our members and citizens across Europe are interested in. That shouldn't discount the need to focus on uh, the climate crisis we're also facing. There is a strong link, I think, between the health crisis and the climate crisis that uh, we are experiencing. And again, the EU has been remarkably good in showing leadership in that regard, together with member states, have put in place very ambitious goals, 
and it is our responsibility to live up to the expectations of the citizens and also take with us the international community. Again, there, the EU institutions and the member states have been good in pushing forward the debate across the world, and we need to remain ambitious and vigilant in that regard. The other thing we need to really look at, and that's something that came through our consultations with our member organizations, is the question of uh, democracy. The democracy has been under pressure for a while now, across the world, in Europe, and even within our union. Uh, we have seen world-world developments in a variety of countries. And again, the rule of law, democracy, are at the core of the European project, and it is a responsibility to ourselves, but also to the rest of the world, to uphold those values that the European Union is built on. So I would like to see uh, Mrs. Mr. van der Leyen stress the commitment of the European Union democratic principles, uh, and like Hans said earlier, uh, make sure that the EU takes a robust position in those countries where the democratic principles are violated and trampled upon. One more thing that is very much related to democracy is, of course, civic space. Uh, when uh, authoritarian leaders uh, take hold, the, the first thing they do is try to squeeze the life out of civil society and to shrink civil space where we operate. It's remarkably important that the European Union defends and uh, safeguards civil society across the EU and beyond. Because without civil society, our democracy suffers. Without civil society, citizens feel cut off from the decisions that affect them. So it, it is imperative, again, that the, the European Commission and its president make that message loud and clear. And of course, in this context, I'd like to mention the Conference of the Future of Europe too. It is something that uh, the European movement and all our members are very much interested in. It is an opportunity to continue the conversation we started at the European elections. The European Parliament and all the political parties did a fantastic job ahead of the elections, engaging with citizens, and we saw that in the high turnout, people were genuinely interested, they really paid attention, they, they engaged with, their, with the candidates and the representatives. And I think the conference is an opportunity to bridge the two elections. Uh, the timetable has shifted a little bit, but in, because of the crisis, but in a way that has made us put the conference in the middle, halfway through the previous election of the next European Parliament election. So it's a good opportunity to continue the dialogue we started in 2019, all the way until 2024, and make sure that the citizens that really stepped forward, took notice, and uh, voted for, for the European Parliament elections continue to feel heard and consulted and involved in the decisions that affect them. One last thing, uh, and again, I think it was very important that that was mentioned already, is the geopolitical role of the European uh, Commission and the role that the EU can play in its neighborhood and beyond. You know, we are seeing seismic changes around the world. Uh, the role of the United States under its current leadership, the assertiveness of China, uh, the emergence of other powers, uh, much more uh, aggressive, so to say, in our very neighborhood, Russia, Turkey, and others. I think it's very important that we strengthen uh, the ability of the European Union to speak with one voice on those issues. The departure of the UK is regrettable in many, many ways, but especially when it comes to geopolitics. Uh, and for that reason, we need to ensure that we pull together and we work closer with each other so we can both defend our interests, both the, our European values, but also try to project them and spread them. Because the more uh, hostile the environment becomes, the harder it is for, for Europe and its member states to operate and continue functioning. And I mentioned Brexit, so I, I want to, to make a, a last point on that. Uh, recent developments are uh, very worrying. Uh, we, we are unfortunately entering a stage that a lot of us hope wouldn't happen. The possibility of not having um, a comprehensive deal with one of our closest partners. Uh, that would be a great save. And, uh, and obviously, uh, it takes two to tango. And if the British government isn't prepared to engage constructively with the EU, it's very hard to have a deal. But I think for that reason, we need to double our efforts to prepare ourselves. The, the European Commission and the EU as a whole has done very well engaging with businesses, citizens uh, on both sides of the channel, all those that will be affected by the UK's unfortunate decision to leave. Uh, we need now to face the facts and prepare ourselves for the worst. Uh, and, and one last thing, I am Greek, as you probably guessed from my, from my accent. What's happening at the moment in Moria, it's, uh, it's really 
heartbreaking, to put it mildly. Uh, for years now, we have been trying to get hold of this uh, crisis, and, uh, and I think we're running out of time. It's a moral as well as a political obligation to resolve what's going on over there. And in this particular case, it isn't just up to the Commission or the European Union. Member states need to take the responsibility, show solidarity, both towards each other, but also those people who are in great need for support. And we shouldn't forget that they are running away from harm, and we should provide to them with uh, the support and the protection that they deserve. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the interventions and answering questions. Thanks very much, Petras. That was really an intriguing presentation. And um, actually, together with um, the political outlook uh, Mr. Van Baan gave us, your um, presentation from a civil society point of view, from what your member organizations expect of the speech, pretty much now um, give a good basis for bringing, our, bringing in our third um, person who is discussing with us. It's Valentin Kreilinger, who is the policy and research coordinator at the European Liberal Forum. Valentin has been working with um, the De Leo Center in Berlin before and um, with the Hertie School of Government and has been um, publishing extensively on European issues. And um, Valentin wants to um, describe to us uh, and, and, and give a setting about what kind of strange animal this European version of the State of the Union speech actually is. And I, I really am interested to hear this because um, we now have heard by um, the two um, panelists what the expectations are. And maybe, Valentin, you can set a bit the stage of um, and answer the question if this, if this speech can actually deliver has any chance on delivering on what um, is expected um, as expressed by our panelists. So Valentin, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, uh, the speech is, and we already heard that, is an opportunity for the Commission President to address the European Parliament and the wider public. And Ursula von der Leyen will look back on the work of the Commission over the past year and present her priorities for the next year. And as Hans already said, uh, the speech is immediately followed by a plenary debate um, during which the leaders of the different political groups and other MEPs take the floor. Now, uh, this is already the ninth State of the Union event. Uh, the speech on the State of the Union was introduced by uh, one of Ursula von der Leyen's predecessors, uh, Jose Manuel Barroso in 2010. And it is actually modeled upon the State of the Union uh, speech by the President of the United States, which usually takes place in late January or early February. And this actually makes the speech a presidential element in the EU's political system. Um, although, oh, you know, that uh, many prime ministers or heads of state in EU member states also hold speeches on the state of the nation. Um, just importantly to note, when the European Parliament uh, is elected every five years, uh, no such speech takes place, uh, thus there was no speech in 2019. The speech is even legally enshrined, so according to the interinstitutional agreement between the Parliament and the Commission, um, in the first part session of September, the debate will be held in which the President of the Commission shall deliver an address taking stock of the current year and looking ahead to the priorities for the following years. And importantly, I quote now, to that end, the President of the Commission will in parallel set in writing uh, to Parliament the main elements guiding the preparation of the Commission work program for the following year. That's the framework agreement on relations between uh, European Parliament and European Commission. So after, after the speech, the Commission President will send a letter of intent, that's how the document is called, uh, to the President of the European Parliament and the rotating presidency, in that case, uh, in our case now, Germany. And in this letter, the Commission will explain what it intends to do through legislation and other initiatives. So generally the speech guides the preparation of the Commission's work program for the next year. 
and uh, you know that uh, this time the conference on the future of Europe, Petros alluded to it, is still not launched and EU leaders agreed on the next uh, multi-annual financial framework at their 90 hour summit uh, in July. Uh, Peter, you were covering it extensively, uh, but uh, the EU leaders still need to negotiate uh, with the European Parliament. In terms of the impact that this speech has, it is, uh, you, you already alluded to that, uh, to a certain extent, a bubble event. So uh, SORTOY is usually the most used hashtag on Twitter on the day of the speech. Um, but in this context, it's also important to note that the Commission President is not just um, uh, addressing the members of the European Parliament, but that the chamber is serving as a public forum uh, from which uh, she addresses the citizens of the entire EU. So just to give you a number, uh, last time uh, the abbreviation for State of the Union, uh, hashtag SOTEU, uh, was a worldwide top trend and uh, reached uh, 80,000 tweets, excluding retweets. Uh, this so indicates that the EU is able to reach the decision ma makers, the, the uh, multipliers, and therefore the expectation is uh, that it can reach citizens directly. There are, at least in the past, there have been numerous events taking place in member states uh, by the commission representations, by the regional offices and so on. But uh, traditional media will also play a truly important role to cover Ursula von der Leyen's first stage of the Union speech as Commission President. And in this context, I, I, I want to conclude by pointing to some of the difficulties that, that arise uh, when it comes to that speech. So, uh, for instance, uh, in the past, um, there has always been a battle between the German Bundestag and the European Parliament. And under, under the Juncker Commission, uh, several times, the main budgetary debate in German Parliament took place at exactly the same time as the uh, uh, State of the Union speech uh, by the Commission President. And this is, of course, uh, diverting and impeding uh, media attention, uh, which uh, well would, would um, be important and which could be more easily focused on that uh, political event if there was no um, no concurrence from the other level in the EU's multi-level system. Uh, so uh, uh, it is. It will be interesting to see uh, how this uh, plays out uh, in 2020 and whether, in fact, then uh, in many member states uh, this will be a top a top news item uh, in the evening news uh, of the main of the main public broadcasting uh, channels. Thank you. Thanks very much, um, Valentin, for also setting the stage in that respect and um, these interesting, really interesting details on how the speech came about and a bit of the history and also a bit of the nitty gritty behind that. Um, so let's see if um, it's trending on social media again like it was in the, in the last years. Um, I want to remind participants once more, um, I'm now asking questions to our panelists and um, I made some notes. We have lots of stuff to discuss, but if you have some particular thing which is interesting for you, do write us um, your question on the Q&A section in um, the Zoom toolbox or you can also send in questions via Facebook and um, I will then forward them to our panelists. Now, when listening to you three, um, one current theme, one thing everybody has been mentioning is that um, Ursula von der Leyen has to connect um, to the citizens in the member states, has to, in a way, um, leave the Brussels bubble with her speech. Of course, this is also made challenging, and um, this is what I want to ask Mr. Van Baalen. This is also challenging because um, the Corona crisis, which of course all three of you also have mentioned, the Corona crisis has shown us that when there is a real life and death issue in Europe, citizens are redirecting um, their search for answers to national capitals. So um, there has been studies in Germany um, which kind of stated that trust in politics, in national governments, in regional governments, even in mayors, 
in, 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 in people doing politics in town halls has been increasing actually a lot in the first months of this corona crisis, whereas trust in the European institutions didn't erode, but it kept quite low. Um, Mr. Van Baan, to what extent has Ursula von der Leyen, from your point of view as a, as a long-time politician, managed the corona crisis in a good way? Or do we have to say, and you mentioned this when you pointed out the recent travel restrictions chaos, do we have to say that the Commission, for instance, in this topic has not learned the lessons which have been taught to all of, the, all of us in the hard way in March when member states closed their borders? We wanted to do a coordinated approach after that. And now people are on holiday. You're in Spain and um, the German government comes up with a travel warning that you um, really have to leave immediately. Belgium has different warnings, France as well. Where are we in this crisis mode commission? How well did they do? Well, it is of course not uh, an honest thing to say that Mrs. van der Leyen has mismanaged because the European Union, the commission doesn't have, let me say the authority uh, to say this should be done or this should be done. So it is about, uh, let me say, coordination. Uh, and we can learn a lot of uh, Germany, which is a federative state, where the lender, uh, the member states of, the, of, of Germany, uh, have, let me say, the, uh, the responsibility about public health, but the Bund, the federal government, is coordinating and leading. So let's learn from this. But you can't say, like a lot of people, uh, that uh, von der Leyen, the Commission, has mismanaged if she doesn't have the tools. So what von der Leyen should do, and I hope she will do, is not just to blame the member states, but in one-on-one -on -one conversations, together also with uh, Chancellor Merkel, who is indeed the rotating president of the EU, speak with all governments and say, we should, in case of a second wave of corona, really coordinate. Uh, and this is a thing not of over-promising and say we are morally right, but the only coordinator which we have can only be the European Commission. So von der Leyen cannot be blamed. Uh, the Eurosceptics who always say, well, the European Union has done wrong, I say, then we should give the European Union uh, the authority to do something. But because it's not a fact, von der Leyen has to be an able diplomat, and uh, especially in the second wave, which probably could come. Uh, and therefore also this State of Union speech is important, uh, that she comes with concrete proposals in this. Uh, and again, uh, that uh, the debate in the European Parliament is not on the level how good we are, but what we can do for the citizen. Uh, so I think von der Leyen has an immense task to do, but together with Chancellor Merkel and the leaders of the Member States, she can do it, I think. Thanks, Mr. Van Baalen. Um, of course, journalists tend to be critical. I, I, I of course, know that um, we can't blame von der Leyen, as you said, for every mismanagement in this crisis. Um, it's, and I think um, you're totally correct to say that it's, of course, in a way, if somebody has failed, then it was the whole of the European leaders and member states as well. I mean, Ms. von der Leyen, as you rightly said, has no tool to um, stop them, for instance, um, with border closures, as we have seen them in March. Nevertheless, this, this theme of crisis, and Petrus, this is where I turn to you, and you mentioned it already, this theme of crisis also, of course, is not only is not only true when it comes to corona and uh, economic fallout of this pandemia, but also, and you mentioned it, Petrus, the more recent pictures we've seen from Moria and the Greek islands. In a way, this has, of course, been um, a problem Ms. von der Leyen has inherited by her predecessors. So the refugee crisis was there in 2015 and 16, and honestly speaking, it has never gone away. Nevertheless, up till now, we do not have um, new proposals by the commissions on a new asylum and migration policy. What do you think your member agencies, parties, NGOs do expect in that regard by the Commission President and her speech next week? Yeah. 
Like you said, this problem has been around for a while and is not going to go uh, away anymore, uh, at least while the root causes of uh, mass population displacement are removed, be it conflict, environmental disaster, poverty, etc., etc. So while those um, underlying issues are, aren't being dealt with, we will always um, have at our doorstep uh, desperate people who are trying to find a better life for themselves. And like you said, we need some uh, structural uh, legislative uh, choices uh, to be made. Um, there is a need to reform uh, the, the double system. The, we need to uh, renegotiate a little bit the distribution of the burden among member states. And uh, we need to reconsider also the, the partnerships we have made with uh, actors in our neighborhood in, uh, in managing the inflow of refugees and, and migrants. Um, and there, again, I'd like to echo Hans, the, the tools at the disposal of the EU are limited. Uh, it, it really needs to be um, a response that is adopted in unison with member states, and it's also um, bought over by member states. We've had several proposals and efforts spearheaded by some member states and the EU institutions, but because there was no buy-in by other member states, those uh, initiatives didn't lead to anything. So it, I think it is imperative that we uh, we find a framework where everybody can really come and go. Of course, if I had the solution, I wouldn't be here. Uh, but uh, what we see from our members, and that includes, as I said, people from the left and the right, from trade unions, environmental organizations, NGOs, who are often active on the ground, is the, the need for immediate relief. You know, while there are thousands of people kept in uh, concentration camps, for a lack of a better term, uh, we, have, we are not able to really confront uh, the issues uh, head on. Uh, I think we just need a much more comprehensive uh, solution. And, and I would like to commend here the member states who have taken in refugees from Greece and other, and other countries. Uh, I would like to commend the, the member states who are hosting uh, a lot of those uh, refugees and migrants, but until we release the pressure away from the periphery, uh, we will not be able to really uh, address the root causes of the, of the problem. Yeah, thanks, Petros. Um, interesting enough, uh, with the answers of um, Hans and Petros, we had both saying that the Commission does not have the tools um, to achieve certain objectives. We've been discussing about Corona, which is the big topic, and we've, we've been discussing about the refugee policy, which of course also will be a big topic. Um, let me turn with this observation to you, Valentin, with maybe a bit of a nasty question. But um, if for two of the biggest crises Europe faces, um, two of our experts say it's difficult for the Commission um, to come up with proposals and impose them because the tools are missing, which of course is definitely true. Isn't this State of the Union speech um, risking to, over, to, to sell far too big promises to European citizens? Isn't it in a way in itself the fact that you model a speech after um, um, the speech to Europe, the, the, the American president is doing each year? Isn't this in itself a problem when you have a commission president delivering the speech who in the end of the day, of course, is no president of Europe and who is not able um, in, in at least two of the main issues she will have to address to really um, bring about change in the member states by the tool she's having. So how much, and this is also what Federico, one of our participants is asking, how big of a chance does von der Leyen actually have um, with this speech to get closer to citizens in Europe and earn their trust? Valentin. Yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I think uh, you are right that there is the risk of a uh, gap between expectations and the capabilities uh, to deliver when it comes to these two crises and this this capability expectations gap is in the end uh, nothing new we are seeing that uh, in, in in foreign policy as well for for many for many years but uh, i i think we we are getting closer to knowing where the problems in the institutional system are so uh, what we currently see is uh, policy gridlock uh, in, in, in the asylum and migration policy. 
and uh, well, we are trying to resolve it. We, are, we will see if the Commission comes up with a proposal. And I think uh, when it comes to this very speech, and the European Parliament has been uh, trying to make its voice heard in the previous months, but um, this speech will particularly be a test case for what von der Leyen announced as a special relationship between the European Commission, between her European Commission and the Parliament. So um, at, what do I mean by saying it is a test case? Uh, I mean, uh, well, uh, the, the mainstream political parties in the European Parliament, they will listen to whether she, for instance, encourages them further to um, push their weight and uh, negotiate uh, with the Council in a way of uh, further changing the MFF and gaining influence on the recovery fund. I think that will be a key test case where everybody around Europe and especially the MEPs will be listening carefully. And um, in that respect, I think uh, well, we know that the problem uh, lies with member states, uh, that they must agree unanimously to, to, to tackling the COVID crisis and to addressing uh, the uh, migration and refugee crisis. So uh, in the past, it didn't help Jean-Claude Juncker that he had proposals that the, the European Parliament was enthusiastic about them, but then they got stuck in the Council. So um, the problem is, is still there. Uh, von der Leyen will have to come up with innovative uh, policy uh, proposals in that speech. She will have to focus on certain key ideas, not have a long list and then a, and a, a long speech. But uh, that is, I think, the, the, the key thing. And if then she somehow manages to launch, not launch, but let's say to put momentum behind the uh, long institutional, inter-institutional struggles about getting started the Conference on the Future of Europe, then the Conference on the Future of Europe can be the tool to actually communicate uh, with citizens and uh, to, to involve them more into the different, the different areas and uh, get their views collected. And one last thing I want to mention, I think von der Leyen now has the particular challenge that this crisis, and I mean the health crisis, is affecting member states so differently. I think there has rarely been so much diversity in something hitting the entire EU, but if we look at the economic uh, growth, or let's say the reduction of economic activity, in some member states it's, it's 4% in the Baltics, uh, sometimes more one-digit numbers, and uh, Southern Europe uh, well above 20% uh, reduction of the GDP and this is a real challenge for her also to find the right message for the entire uh, EU and her 27 member states. Thanks Valentin. I, I want to I wanna follow up on this question of democracy um, in different respects um, quite soon because also some participants have um, very detailed questions on this. But let me first uh, go back to Hans van Baalen and, and dig a bit into, into your expertise when dealing with European leader as an older president, Mr. van Baalen. I mean, you've been saying and echoing um, a word Ms. von der Leyen has used quite frequently in her speeches before the corona crisis. Um, the topic that she wants to lead a geopolitical commission. And um, 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 as, as in a way, it's a bit of um, um, uh, by Hassa, but um, on Monday, two days before her speech, we have, of course, the EU China summit. So it's a three hour video um, conference between not only the heads of um, the EU institutions and um, Ms. Merkel, the German Chancellor for the rotating presidency. But on the other hand, we have the Chinese president um, who is engaging with EU leaders. Um, from a geopolitical perspective, it's very difficult for the EU to position itself. Um, and COVID, of course, has once again demonstrated this, to position itself between the US, um, which under President Trump has been more and more hostile towards the project of European unity, and a more and more assertive China, of course, in the economic field, but far above. Um, um, the economy. What do you think is the right approach for Europeans, for the European Union to, to tackle this challenge? Um, what's, um, from your point of view, 
uh, uh, China policy by the EU, which makes sense. What do you expect um, the EU leaders um, to discuss with Xi on Monday? I hope that the European leadership talking with Xi Jinping is extremely critical because, as I said, China is a dictatorship. Don't call it another way. It's a dictatorship. If you look at internal policies, uh, the repression against the Uyghurs is extreme, against the Tibetans is extreme, but also towards the normal average Chinese citizen. Uh, uh, if you look the power policy in the region, it's extreme. So uh, we have to work together with the United States, with Trump or without Trump, together to contain China. So no niceties. Uh, and if China wants a bilateral investment agreement and other uh, tre treaties concerning trade, we want to have an equal balance. It must be that if the Chinese will not allow uh, Dutch or German or whatever French firms to buy Chinese firms for 50 plus percent, then the same should apply to Chinese firms buying our uh, multinationals or national uh, companies. So we have to be tough, no niceties. Um, and uh, there von der Leyen and uh, Charles Michel should take the lead. Uh, because I must be honest that uh, uh, our German friends, especially Mrs. Merkel, has been quite lenient towards both uh, Russia and China, and that doesn't work. So to be tough. Uh, Mr. Van Baalen, to follow up on this, um, we know, and, and you mentioned it in the end, that um, when it comes to important foreign policy issues, it's very difficult um, to come to an approach which is followed by the whole of the EU because, of course, um, member states' interests are divergent when it comes to Russia, when it comes to China. It has to do with the economy. If you talk about Germany, of course, it has to do with the export economy, with the car industry, you name it. How much do you think would it help um, um, to abolish or try to abolish this principle of unanimity in the foreign policy field? Or is this something which you say will never happen anyway, so stop dreaming about this? It will be difficult, but if you look, for instance, uh, the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte, in one of his speeches, said that he wants to abolish this rule. This is rather new. Five years ago, a Dutch prime minister would not have said so. And we had the same prime minister then. So you see a movement over there. Uh, but uh, if it cannot be done, let me say, in an institutional way, then those member states who want to be tough should do it together. Because we can be hostile, uh, hostage, be taken hostage by, for instance, Viktor Orban or the Polish government. Uh, or today the uh, Bulgarian government or Slovenian government, eh? because there are many governments uh, who are, let me say, well, not helping Europe to unite. Uh, so in this case, concerning, for instance, Russia, to block uh, the, the pipeline, uh, Nord Stream 2, well, you don't need unanimity. I mean, Germany should take the responsibility, supported by member states like the Netherlands, uh, France and others. Um, uh, because there is a strange idea in Brussels that everything has to be done the institutional way. I would not favor to break the law, absolutely not. But you can do a lot informally. So we should do this. Before I turn on um, over to the other panelists and come to these democracy questions um, viewers are having, I want to echo a question Mark has been sending in and rephrase it a bit and, and come to you once more, Hans van Baalen. Do you think, and you mentioned it, do you think in the dealing with countries like Hungary, with leaders like Orban, but also, for instance, with the Polish PiS government, and maybe it's a simple answer, but do you think Ms. von der Leyen has been too lenient and too forgiving? Isn't the fact that on rule of law, she so far has not been very outspoken, one of the really weak spots of this new commission? 
but the European Parliament will speak out. Uh, I mentioned Dacian Solis, the, the, leader, the leader of the uh, Renew Group, the Liberal Group, and he wants a connection with European funds, for instance, the Recovery Fund, and the rule of law, civil liberties, and those kind of things, which are vital to us. Uh, so what the uh, leaders in Europe, the European Council, could not do, maybe the European Parliament can take the lead. Huh? Uh, so, and therefore I say, don't come with 20 or 30 priorities, but come to some concrete things which you can realize. It will be difficult because, uh, again, it is not only Viktor Orban, there are three, four, five other European leaders who are not, uh, let me say, um, positive in their way to have a united European idea. Uh, Janusz Janša in Slovenia is an urban light. Uh, Boyko Borisov in Bulgaria is, uh, let me say, close to being an urban light. We have yeah. called PAS government. Uh, how, about, but, and, uh, listen, how about Mr. Babis? Just for the record, we have to ask about him as well as he's a member of your party group. Yes. Well, Babis is not uh, curtailing civil liberties in the Czech Republic. Mm -hmm. That is not the problem. There is a discussion about, let me say, his private assets yeah. and European funding. Yeah. Uh, and it is looked into. And uh, we have to be uh, strict in this concern. But the Czech Republic is a free country and Babish is not misusing his uh, authority in the corona crisis. With that, uh, Mr. Van Baan, let me, let me turn with this rule of the sort of connecting the rule of law to um, spending, European spending from the MFF, from the European budget. Our, our, our listeners are interested in how, the, and this would be a question to Valentino, of course, to Petros, whoever wants to jump in. Our, our, our listeners are interested in how um, the budget, the MFF, um, the negotiations about everybody has witnessed in the end of July, um, Valentin mentioned the 19 hours. Listeners want to know how the budget could be used to actually get a, a, a more tougher connect of what the European Union is doing with its citizens. For instance, Sophia Blanche, she's saying um, and asking Petros, could um, you own resources and increasing the possibility of you own resources, could that be a tool of um, better reconnecting the European public with European politics? I mean, the idea behind it is clear. If Europe has its own money to spend and raises its own money, it has to be responsible, more responsible how it uses the money. This might be behind it. What's your Petros take on, the, on Sophia's question? We have long advocated uh, the need to introduce uh, own resources in how we raise the EU budget. Actually, if you look at the treaties, it was never the intention that uh, the majority of EU finances will come from member states. It's a disproportionate burden on the budget of EU member states that has been imposed over the years on an ad hoc fashion. So we, we have to have an open discussion. The European Parliament has led on that significantly over the last uh, few months. And it's really encouraging to see that uh, it has part, become part of the debate because we have been calling for it for a while. There, there are a variety of ways to do it, but I, I echo the, the, the question and the point that Sophia made, that it will provide an opportunity to link closer citizens with uh, the EU and, and also uh, spending decisions with what uh, really people need on the ground because that's, that's also crucial. Uh, on the issue of linking uh, EU funding with uh, the rule of law, we should never forget that EU funding is supposed to be there to help European citizens in a variety of ways, uh, to supplement spending by member states, uh, to provide a longer framework. So we should never do anything that will penalize uh, citizens in that regard, even in countries, because uh, the problem isn't with Hungary or with Poland uh, or with Slovenia or with whichever other country, it's perhaps with certain uh, leaders who have, or political parties who have uh, deviated a bit yeah. from the So whatever we do, we must always make sure that EU citizens are not, are not penalized. And that's a good solution. Enable the EU to direct funds uh, straight to where they need it, rather than having to go through uh, national governments, give the power to the EU to really engage directly with the beneficiaries of uh, the funding remit. Use also civil society. Civil society has a big role to play in, uh, in supporting, in, in bringing uh, EU decisions and EU funding even on the ground. 
I think there is a role to play there to alleviate the pressure and make sure that citizens continue to benefit for that financial support. Thanks, Petros. Valentin, we are running out of time, unfortunately, but I want to turn this question also to you with, um, um, please, maybe a quick answer. The way, and it's a big question, of course, but the way Ursula von der Leyen has managed the um, next generation EU <coughs> tool and the MFF so far has not been very forthcoming for the European Parliament. So the results of the July summit actually resemble like an attack on everything which is important and dear for the European Parliament. How much does this speech we've been discussing about for an hour now give her a chance to, to get a turnaround on the way Parliament feels in a way sidelined by this whole process, which actually should be in the heart of the European Parliament's decision making, the budgetary process? Yeah, it will be, it will be uh, let's say, crucial, crucial weeks ahead for the European mm -hmm. Parliament uh, to, 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 to really um, try to shape this outcome and change the, uh, the uh, result uh, of, the, of the summit in the way that it wants, if it wants. I mean, uh, there, there are diverging views in the European Parliament when it comes uh, to, to the size uh, of, the, of the different uh, components. Um, but uh, I think if the European Parliament manages to find a united position and itself clearly defines the priorities that it wants to achieve, mm -hmm. for instance, when it comes to the rule of law, then this position by the European Parliament can have an influence in, in, in shaping the, the functioning of the, uh, of the uh, 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 facility uh, that is being used and in that respect uh, with respect to to the functioning uh, I think it's important to have in mind that there are monitoring tools and mechanisms already in place so we have the European semester which is mm -hmm. uh, monitoring mm -hmm. economic and fiscal policy coordination and the European Commission is already issuing country specific recommendations on a whole range of policy areas so, for instance, when it comes to the rule of law, the rule of law in member states is uh, routinely uh, uh, scrutinized yeah. and criticized by the European Commission. Uh, member states then endorse these uh, recommendations. And now the crucial thing is what kind of link is being made between these yeah. recommendations and the, and the um, let's say, payments or loans that are being received. And the crucial thing is which decision-making mode is then exactly. being used for this one. And that's the crucial battle of the weeks and months ahead. And uh, there, von der Leyen is setting somehow the scene. Uh, okay. The European Parliament uh, groups will carefully listen to her and yes. it, will, it will define the rest of her mandate because either the special relationship between Commission and Parliament works yeah. or there is no special relationship and she remains uh, the, uh, the uh, let's say, uh, the commission president appointed and brought into office by member states. There's so much we could go on to discuss about. I think even especially the rule of law would um, be a great topic for a whole session of this um, on the agenda series of the European Liberal Forum. I want to thank you three um, panelists, Hans van Baalen, Petros and Valentin, to take part for your input, for your insights. Thanks very much. And um, luckily, we also have a wrap up of our session by our friend Anastasia, whom I turn the floor to now. Anastasia, what's your key point from what we've been discussing here? Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you very much all for this excellent discussion. I think we clearly understand that is a lot of is at stake that we will hear and will listen to next week. And the job is very tough. And for the European Commissioner to try to bring the unity and reset her agenda or maybe reshape her agenda, that's not going to be easy. We're all looking forward to it. We hope that uh, this is the chance for the EU maybe to define itself and clearly show that it can make a difference, especially in these challenging times and all the swords hanging around. Uh, that can be very difficult, but we need to make sure that we go beyond the EU bubble and we reach out to the citizens. I think this is the key message to keep with us for the next week. 
and let's see what happens and what will um, Ursula von der Leyen say during her address. Um, again, thank you all and I hope that um, all of you will be joining us in two weeks for the next edition of the agenda series. We will talk on the 1st of October, the same time about digital platforms. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Pleasure.